All right, so thanks again for everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna be learning about bees and wannabes with Britt from the U of M Extension. I am Amy Kilgore. I work for Great River Greening. I'm the Outreach Program Manager. And with me today is Becca Tucker, Ecologist and Program Manager. And I'll let Becca do a quick little introduction about what we're doing, and then we'll turn it over to Britt. So thanks again to everybody for joining us. I really appreciate you all being here and uh, watching the video potentially in the future, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we are Great River Greening. We are a nonprofit habitat restoration organization uh, based out of St. Paul that uh, does work kind of all around Minnesota. A lot of what we do, uh, especially in recent years, is focusing on pollinator habitat and enhancing prairies and path sides and that sort of thing. So we wanted to take some time and learn a little bit more about the pollinators themselves. Uh, Minnesota has an excitingly large number of native bees and pollinator species. So today we're going to uh, hear a little bit more about them, dive into the individual groups, uh, learn what is a bee, what isn't a bee, and uh, take about an hour time to gain a little bit of knowledge that sometime hopefully you'll be able to go outside and actually put into practice in the field. So without uh, any other information uh, needed for right now, let's throw it over to Britt and uh, she can introduce herself and go forward with the presentation. Perfect. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, well, like they said, we're here looking at bees, how you know something you have is a bee and not a bee. Uh, the sort of standard joke in the business, right, is if it's not a bee, it's a wannabe. Nyak, nyak, nyak. And sometimes there's mimicry on purpose and sometimes not. We'll get into that. Uh, but I'm Britt Forsberg. I am an extension educator with the University of Minnesota. I primarily work with the Master Naturalist program, um, but still in, in some pollinator things. I worked with the Minnesota Bee Atlas where we had volunteers across the state who were helping us document the distribution and diversity of wild bees. Uh, and before I started that, I could probably tell you things that were bees, but I had no idea about the incredible diversity of bees. I had no skills at identifying bees. Uh, and I am not an expert now, but uh, this is just a point made that it's, it's kind of challenging, but you can learn it. I know because I did it, right? I, I don't have a degree in entomology. I haven't been studying bees for a long time. Um, so I've tried to break this down into some categories that'll be pretty easy for you to recognize. Uh, and one note, if I look distracted, it's because I have my screen with my presentation over here. Your pictures are over here. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm paying attention to you all. All right, so this is a uh, graphic that the U of M Bee Lab has put together um, showing in the US uh, all the different types of bees and kind of how they shake out uh, number wise. So the bees that come to your mind right away normally are honeybees and bumblebees. But we know a lot about honeybees uh, because people are essentially farming them, right? It's a hobby for a lot of people. It's important to our agricultural system. A lot of the sort of colloquial things we say about bees are honeybees. Uh, bumblebees we notice because they're really big, they're loud. Um, they make a lot of noise as they move around. But if you look up that little bitty yellow sliver at the top is the number of bumblebee species. Uh, and then the one honeybee species compared to the 3,600 different species of bees that we have in the US. And then if you look at that too, just an example of these pictures, they're incredibly diverse. So if you ask a kid to draw a bee, you're gonna get kind of an oval with some yellow and black stripes. But looking at this picture, you know, two of those could be said that they really have distinguishable yellow and black stripes. There are all sorts of different colors, patterns. Um, so they really are incredibly diverse. There are a lot of other things you could pull from this, um, but it is kind of a complicated graphic. So I'm gonna take those in some other slides. So uh, bees don't just look different bees act different from each other in a lot of ways. So we have phrases like the queen bee. Um, this works in honeybees. There is an actual queen. There is one bee that lays eggs 
and all the other bees in that colony take care of her and help rear those offspring. Um, so that's the picture on the far left. That queen has a dot on her. Uh, lots of times beekeepers will mark them because it's just a lot easier to find them. I uh, spent four-ish years uh, trying to keep honeybees. I was tremendously unsuccessful. They died every year. Uh, experienced beekeepers will pull up a frame that has hundreds of bees and tell you, oh yeah, there's the queen. And I got to tell you, after that whole time, I still looked at them and I thought all the bees look stinking the same. Uh, so that's why marking comes in handy. The middle picture is a bumblebee nest. There are a lot fewer of them and they don't have as much organization, right? They kind of just build those cups, those wax cups anywhere they want. Um, but similar to the honeybees, they have a queen, they have workers who go out and bring pollen back, who bring nectar back, who take care of those offspring. But the vast majority of the bees that we have in Minnesota are solitary. So there's no queen, no structure like that. Um, just one female bee who takes care of her nest. So they might live in the ground. And that top right photo uh, is of my vegetable garden where it's a pretty innocuous nest. It doesn't have all of the grains. It's not like a, a tower, like an ant nest. It really is just a little hole in the ground. And then I happen to notice occasionally that a bee would be flying in and out of. Uh, and some of them like that leaf cutter bee in the lower right will nest in uh, stems, holes. They can get pretty flexible. They don't have to be natural materials. Uh, I had a colleague who left his trailer uh, unhitched and came back and found that bees had found the little hole where the pin sticks in and filled that up as a nest. They just found a little cavity uh, and they made themselves right at home. But again, though they're laying eggs, uh, but there's no parental care. You know, those, those females are only there laying the eggs. The males have one job once they've mated, um, they're not involved any longer. So I reference nests a little bit, but their life cycles really tie into what these spaces look like. So on the far left side, uh, you don't have to see the details, but just, I showed you a picture of the last slide of a hole where I knew a bee lived and it looks so simple from the surface, but you can go down and they can have these different branches, different shapes. And sometimes there are some bees that will share uh, where they each have kind of their own side tunnels and they'll look at, they'll keep one main hole together. Um, so they can kind of take turns guarding. So they're kind of an in-between level of being social. <clears throat> um, the top middle there, a frame pull out of a honey beehive. There's another bumblebee nest in the lower right. And then the upper right, is another place where those cavity or stem nesting bees might live. The previous slide, it was a hole drilled into wood, but this is in a stem. So they make these partitions where each little compartment has one egg uh, and then one ball of pollen. Uh, they seal it off and keep going through the end. So, and just a little bit about why those nests look the way they do. Uh, the far left picture of a honey beehive in winter, honeybees make this honey that we all like to eat uh, to keep themselves going through winter. They're the only bees that are active and they will, they can keep it uh, sometimes 80 degrees inside their hive uh, by vibrating. And so they go into one big ball and they'll put the queen in the middle so that she stays warm and makes it through. And again, the honey is their energy for the whole winter. <laughs> But all the other bees that we have in Minnesota will either be hibernating um, or they're kind of in a diapause. They're stuck in their development and they haven't fully transitioned to adult yet. So the right image here is a bumblebee life cycle. So we're kind of at the end of the season for a lot of bumblebees now. Um, new queens are being uh, born, is created. Uh, you know, the eggs are laid and then they're fed a lot a lot of resources. Um, they'll go out and they'll mate with males. Then those males die. Um, all the workers who took care of those new queens as they were young will die. Any of the queens that started the nest colony earlier this season will die. And it's just those new queens who will overwinter. So at the very bottom there is one queen by herself overwintering. They have a kind of antifreeze in their bodies that helps get them through to next year. And then they can use that sperm that they stored to lay eggs and start a new colony. 
it's a bit of a similar process for those solitary bees. But again, no one's taking care of anybody. They just lay those eggs. So right now we could have some adults flying around who are laying eggs, but there are also a lot of eggs that were laid earlier this spring where those adults have already died. They're only active for a few weeks. Uh, and then those larvae hatched out, ate up those pollen stores. Uh, and now they're kind of stuck diapause. Uh, they're waiting. They'll be in a pupa throughout the winter and then they'll come out as adults next year. And one thing that is not related to BID, but I like to throw in because uh, we're sort of halfway there in our messaging and I wanna make sure that it gets all the way there. So uh, I see all the time a recommendation that if you wanna help the pollinators to uh, cut your plants down, right? Leave some stems up for them, but you have to leave them a lot longer uh, than, than that messaging really gets you to. So all of our, our plants that are out there are perennials right now, and when they're green and living, it's a lot harder for bees to use them for their nests. Uh, they just can't get in, they're tougher. Uh, so at the end of this fall, you could cut them down to 12 or 18 inches. And now that, that would leave a little, you know, an easy place for a bee to get in next year. But so your first year, leave all your stems up. So we're at the top. See if I can get my mouse, here we go. Top of that graphic here. Um, so you can cut them down now, you could cut them down in the spring. Either way, it's next year that this year's plants will be host to bees who might lay their eggs in there. Um, so they'll grow all season long. Uh, your new stems usually cover those up. So I think people wanna cut their perennials down because they look neater, but you really don't notice, uh, I think, when you leave your stems there. Uh, if it's a, a developed garden, if it's a new garden, you have a lot of space, you know, your plants are just getting started, it's a little more obvious. But uh, I don't know, my advice is typically just be a lazy gardener. So I'm not the one to ask if you need a neat garden. But because those bees need to overwinter in their pupil state, uh, you need to leave those stems up for another year. So that second winter, don't cut the stems down yet. They still have bees in them. And so not until that third spring that those adult bees could come out. So again, uh, there are a lot of places that are really good at telling people about cutting their plants down, but I think a lot of people cut them down, you know, in fall and then that's the end where then they pull their stems out, clear out their gardens, better to leave them. Uh, and then that's kind of what the stems can look like uh, all bundled up here when different critters are nesting in them. Some, this is just from my yard. They chewed up petals uh, that are pink here, chewed up leaves there, the green, there's some mud, all sorts of different things that they might use. But what you're actually here for, uh, not my side rants about how interesting I find bee life cycles, uh, is to be able to look at bees and know a little bit about them. So the first step, it is to know that you're actually looking at a bee. Uh, sometimes this feels easy and sometimes it turns out that it is not because there are some critters that try really hard to look like bees. Uh, but things to pay attention to are their wings. Uh, bees have four wings, there are two pairs, so two wings on each side. Uh, they don't separate them out as far as butterflies, so it's not always obvious. But in this, this picture we can see fairly well, like here's the dividing line on that side. And here's the dividing line here. They do further complicate things because they, it's kind of like having a zipper. They can pull their wings together when they fly. And so again, they're not gonna be four wings spaced out. Uh, but when we look at flies, it's clear that they only have two wings. And so uh, that's just a thing to look for. Another characteristic to pay attention to are the antennae. So bees have long antennae and they have a joint here. It's like your elbow. Uh, where of course you don't always have to bend your elbow, but you can. So you won't always see that angle there. Um, but again, they're longer and you know that bees can move it there. Um, their eyes are on their side of the head. So from the side view, we can see this kind of long eye. It looks really huge from here, but just wait till we see flies. You'll see what giant eyeballs actually look like. Um, so again, looking at the side, there is some hair on top. So the eyes don't connect at the top. 
Uh, and then the last feature to look for are pollen collecting hairs. So that's, that's what most bees do. They're out there collecting pollen and they're bringing it back to their nests. Um, so they need somewhere for that pollen to stick. Bee hairs are a little bit different from other insect hairs. So a lot of flies are pretty fuzzy, um, but bees have branched hairs. I had a colleague who liked to say that bees all have split ends and that's just more surface area so they can grab more pollen. And then for some of the bees we'll look at, uh, where those hairs are becomes really important for ID. So think about those four things, checking out the wings, the antennae, the eyes, and then looking for hairs. So some other groups that can get confusing, wasps. Wasps are actually very closely related to bees. So they have a lot of similar characteristics. Um, they have their eyes in the same location. They have the same kind of antennae. Um, but they don't have pollen collecting hairs. They tend to have very smooth bodies. Uh, and then the, the wasp waist, something to look for too, that sometimes it's exaggerated like this bee or this wasp on the right, that it's very, very thin. Um, but sometimes, and it's just, um, so they're not elongated, but it's very clear where those three body segments are. And this wasp, and you know, a couple, couple hairs around, Wasps move some pollen, but they're not nearly as efficient as bees. I also think it's a lot more likely anecdotally, I haven't seen this in anybody else's ID tips, um, but colorful legs seem a lot more common on wasps than on bees. Um, so there are a couple of bees that will have different colored legs. Uh, most of the time, if they're colorful, there's pollen on them, um, but like these yellow, bright yellow legs seem more common in wasps. And then the last group that I'll mention are flies. So I said, yeah, that bee looked like a head big eyes, but these, whoa, right? Like that head is just eyeballs. That's basically all they have. Uh, and then you can see they're connecting just about. Um, so that's why it's so hard to swat flies, right? They have that range of motion just everywhere that they can pick up around them. Looking at the antennae too, um, flies, can have variable antennae, but they tend to be kind of stubby. Um, they come out right next to each other, right in the middle of their head. They also have just two wings. So flies are fairly unique among insects. They have two wings and then they have two little stubs. They're called halt haltiers. That part's not important, um, but often holding them more in a V shape when they're at rest. Bees will sometimes cross them or at least narrow them so they're parallel to each other, but flies are usually out in a V pattern. Uh, and then you can watch their behavior too, right? Flies will let they, you know, kind of take their front legs, shuffle it a little bit in front of their face. Uh, you've seen it happen. It looks more normal in a fly than it looks when I do it. But again, use all of these clues. Use really specific things, but use things that you're just used to noticing um, as well. So I said there are some insects that try really hard to look like bees. Again, sometimes that's on purpose and sometimes uh, it's not in particular. So most, uh, or I guess four of the pictures on this page are flies. We have one robber fly here. So trying very hard to look like a bumblebee. Has those shorter antennae. Um, doesn't have a place on its legs to carry a pollen like a bumblebee would. They have really blunt mouth parts. Uh, I occasionally get pictures that people send in like, what is this bumblebee doing? Because they see uh, a robber fly eating something like a honeybee, right? A honey, uh, a bumblebee would never eat another bee. So that's another place where thinking about those visual cues and then think about behaviors and what feels like it makes sense. Uh, this middle picture here is a bee fly. And they're sort of fuzzy. You can see that there are some things in common with bees but those two wings held out in that V shape. Um, and then these skinny, skinny legs that are of no use holding pollen whatsoever. Up here in the top right is a goldenrod soldier beetle. Uh, and I get questions about these all the time too, because they do have those black and yellow colors. And particularly when they lift their wings to fly, uh, the stripes are a lot more obvious, kind of going the short way across. Um, but they are beetles. Yeah, but this is a hard covering that they lift off when they fly. 
Here's a wasp. Wasps are way more likely to have those black and yellow stripes. So it's not necessarily a case of looking like a bee in particular, but it's looking like what we sometimes have in our head as an image of a bee, right? The critter that is flying around you when you're having a ham sandwich, drinking a soda, that's a wasp. Um, bees don't want to drink pop. Bees don't want to eat ham sandwiches, um, but wasps are carnivores and more into that stuff. Moving down this lower right picture is a flower fly or hover fly. Um, they're really small. They spend a ton of time around flowers. And so um, sometimes by watching behavior, I mean, they're doing, they're visiting flowers like bees. They are often also black and yellow like bees. But again, we see those large eyes, stubby antennae, um, wings out in that V shape at rest. Uh, and the common name hoverfly, uh, they'll sit in the air a bit more. You know, bees are typically en route to somewhere. You know, they don't just sit and stay right next to the flower. This middle one is a clear wing moth, similar colors. It's fuzzy, but we can't see those three body parts. Uh, and they have different antennae. And then this last one here is another surfeit fly. So those tiny antennae, big eyes, um, trying for all its life to look like a bee, thinking that it might be able to uh, sneak up on things it want to eat, wants to eat. Maybe it wants to avoid being eaten itself. Um, there's some, some good mimicry there. So now we get interactive. And I'm sorry, a little bit of the bottom of those slides it doesn't look like it shows up on my screen. The resolution's maybe not quite right. But in the chat, uh, looking at these eight pictures, how many of them look like bees based on the clues that I just gave you? They're just guesses. We've been on this Zoom for, uh, what, 24 minutes. I do not expect you to be an expert, so don't feel bad if you're throwing a wild stab out there. Right? We're all here to learn. So a wide range, it looks like anywhere from one to five. Give you another couple of seconds to think it through. All right, so we have anywhere from one to all of them. Well, none of you thought I tricked you. Nobody said none of them are bees. Uh, so half of them are, there are four different bees. So I'll quickly talk through some of those characteristics to look at. Uh, and then we'll kind of zoom in to uh, individual bee groups. So the top here, a honeybee uh, you know, is fuzzy, would carry a pollen on its legs. It's not the greatest resolution here. I was trying very hard uh, to use a lot of my own photos and some of mine just aren't that great. Uh, over here, I, so this bee does have a lot of pollen collecting hairs on its legs, uh, the very hindmost pair. You can see kind of crossing those wings at rest, rest like I described. Um, this picture I particularly love because look at that tongue. Holy cow, right? That tongue kind of unfolds and goes all the way into that thistle. Super cool. Uh, here, this is a bee. We can, the antennae kind of fade in. It doesn't show up very well in that photo, um, but all the pollen here, the whole bee is fuzzy, those longer, narrower eyes in the head. This one is also a bee longer narrow eyes, those antennae with a joint covered in pollen, doing a very effective job of picking up pollen. This one is a drone fly. So again, those giant eyeballs that take up just about all the head um, and those two wings held in a V, uh, but doing a very good job of mimicking that honeybee's coloring. They can be tricky. Here's another fly, the big, big eyes. Um, again, trying to look like a fuzzy bumblebee but it's not. Here's a robber fly eating a honeybee. I don't know if the bottom of that, it might depend on your screen, I guess, if that shows up. But again, not a bee-like behavior. Uh, different type of legs, shorter antennae, bigger eyes. 
and then one wasp down here that does have those jointed antennae, does have those eyes, some hairs, but again, nor that it's really carrying pollen, uh, not very fuzzy, and it's narrower. So uh, I hope that felt okay when I want the explanations. Again, it's hard, to be, it takes a long time to become an expert, uh, and it's practice that's going to help you out. So before we dive into some of those V groups, I want to just mention a couple of places that you can go for more of that practice, for more information. So uh, I love, love this book, The Bees in Your Backyard. I think it's easy to understand. They're beautiful pictures. Um, it does have some keys in it. And so uh, if you start to get a sense for some of the vocabulary, um, it's really great at helping you get pretty close to what your bee is. It doesn't claim to get you to all bee species. You know, it is kind of covering uh, North America, um, but it could get you to, to a group pretty well. A little more localized, Heather Holmes Bees and Identification uh, and Forage Guide is great. So she's looking just at the Great Lakes area. Uh, and that too will usually get you to a bee group and not an individual bee species. Um, these other three, do a good job of getting you to species. This Bees of the Great Lakes region is a small pocket guide. Uh, it does not try to cover a 10, but it looks at more common ones. And then these two are obviously for bumblebees. This bumblebees of the Eastern United States is in part by the US Forest Service. And so you can download a free PDF online uh, and print it yourself. You can order it if you want to pay, and then they just, you're really just paying for the printing and the binding costs. Um, so it's pretty affordable. And then Bumblebees of North America is, uh, it takes some practice to be able to use it, but very great at bumblebee species. So again, if, if any of this presentation is interesting, you want to learn more, those are the real experts. Those are the people you go find. All right, so um, for the second half, we'll go through some more, I think, common bee groups that you're likely to see. Uh, we'll practice a little bit, and then certainly you can ask any questions. But if things come up, um, go ahead and put those in the chat too. So we'll start with honeybees. The bees that we all talk about and probably get the most press, right? The, when we say the bees are dying, Typically, that news article is talking about honeybees or that they're affected by pesticides or whatever it is. Um, they're more noticeable. You could have 50 to 60,000 of them in one hive. And again, people are, are keeping them. They're classified as livestock. And so if they die, we notice because we care, because we're looking for them. And they're a lot in a place. But they are not native to the US. They were brought by settlers for honey and now used in agriculture. Uh, but to know that you're looking at one, they have this long, a longer abdomen than many of the other bees. When they're flying, their legs dangle. They kind of, they're all clumped together, right? Like you don't see all six legs. They don't have their front legs out in front of, they're all just in that pile of legs. Uh, they're very long. They carry their pollen in balls. So they have a depression on their hindmost leg where they kind of pat that pollen together with a little bit of nectar, making a nice patty and shove it in, I had a person tell me that, oh, I, I get it. It's like cargo pockets for bees. And sure, they're carrying it around on their legs. Um, so there can be a variety of colors. I most often see this kind of tawny amber color. Um, and they do have these hairs all along their eyeball, which I think is totally fascinating and weird. Uh, next up, I chose bumblebees uh, because we think we know them, right? And turns out they don't look like any other bee. They can look like flies or some other mimics, uh, but they're so round, so puffy, so fuzzy and cute. Um, but they also carry their pollen in those balls on their legs. And sometimes it's amazing. I mean, this, what that ball of pollen is three or four times as wide as that bee's leg. But, like the fact that they can fly and carry that, they keep their balance. Totally incredible. Um, they, again, they do live in colonies like honeybees, but much, much smaller, maybe two or 300. 
uh, hard to find their nests. A lot of the times they're living in abandoned rodent nests, sometimes a tussock of grass or <laughs> trash, like old grills. I've heard multiple people tell me, you know, an old grill and dump pile, they opened it up and they found a bumblebee nest inside. One place they don't tend to live is uh, commercial bumblebee boxes. So you can buy a bumblebee house at a garden center. And then uh, the people I know who have had bees nest in them, it's not until a mouse has used it first. <laughs> so something about having kind of broken in, I don't know if it's the little bits of fur, not entirely sure. Uh, but yeah, on the nests being hard to find, sort of if you want an internet rabbit hole, there is a dog, uh, Darwin the bee dog, who has a social media account, who is being trained to sniff out and find bumblebee nests, right? Because they're hard to find. And so just think of the number, amount of resources that go into training a dog to find nests, like we're putting a real high value on that. Uh, there are 25-ish uh, bee, bumblebee species in Minnesota. There are a couple that haven't been seen recently, uh, but we're also, the last two years have added new species to that list um, where we weren't, weren't sure that we were in part of their range. And they're here. So, so pretty cool stuff because several of those have been found by citizen scientists. One was on a naturalist um, in the Duluth area last summer. And so those weren't experts who were out surveying for their jobs. This was just a person taking a picture of bumblebees. And we wouldn't have that information without that person's help. So just a plug for monitoring, which you'll get at the end too. All right, leaf cutter bees, I add these next. Uh, because we're in a pretty good part of the season to find them. They're called leaf cutter bees because they chew pieces of leaves uh, for their nest. Sometimes they'll mash it all up in kind of a leaf paste, and sometimes they cut out these really fun circles. Uh, so you can actually find leaves that it kind of looks like someone took a hole punch to them. And they're not neighborhood hoodlums running around with hole punches, they're actually bees. But this picture in the lower left is of their jaws. So they're huge. Right, that's how they cut out those big leaf circles because they just have those big chompers. And it's kind of incredible. They can carry leaf pieces that are almost their own size. They roll it up and hold it in their legs when they fly. So if you can catch it, I don't see it very often, but if you can, it's super cool. Um, they carry their pollen on the underside of their abdomen. So you can see the hairs on this specimen, and then you can see all the pollen here. So you can see as that bee is moving around, she's picking up pollen. Um, she doesn't have to try to collect it. She doesn't have to roll in a certain way, right? It, it's just sticking to those branched hairs. Um, there are several different species, but again, we're gonna look at groups, things that you could reasonably expect to see when you're out. So related to the leaf cutter bees are mason bees. Um, these are earlier season bees. I usually start to see them middle end of April uh, here in St. Paul. They're also pretty beefy. These ones I think are super fun, besides being an early bee where you're kind of just getting out of winter and excited to see anything that looks like spring. Uh, right, Because you could walk past and think that they're all flies. They have that metallic color. I'm usually a dark blue black kind of shiny. Um, but they are bees and, and you'll notice because they do bee things because you see them uh, going for flowers because you see them going in and out of holes. I found them in just the channels and the vinyl windows at our cabin and they were flying up there to nest. Pretty fun. So just like those leaf cutter bees, they have their pollen collecting hairs on the underside of their abdomens. Um, they have these other hairs, but they don't really do anything with those. Uh, they're called mason bees because they use mud for their nests. So they'll pack up a sort of clay type of mud to seal those little tubes. Um, they are very happy to nest in artificial nests. Otherwise, they're pretty big for stems. It's hard to find the right stem. Um, they look for things like holes left by wood boring beetles. Again, they're very adaptable at finding human, long, narrow, human-made tunnels that they can use. And then the last bee in that group are resin bees. Um, 
Again, they have those pollen collecting hairs on the bottom side of their abdomens. Um, they're a later summer bee, and so you'd see them out now. They're very small, um, maybe a quarter-ish inch. <clears throat> and so they're in stems and tunnels as well. But all the same family, they have those pollen collecting hairs on the bottom of their abdomen. All right, green sweepies I think are also really interesting because no one expects bees to be green, let alone this really bright, shiny, metallic green. Uh, so sometimes the whole bee is green, and then sometimes just the abdomen, uh, or the just the head of the thorax, and the abdomen that is not green. Uh, they will be striped like this. <clears throat> and yes, all of the bees, all of these pictures even are from Minnesota. They are either my photos, or Don Leone is a master naturalist and former Bee Atlas volunteer who is incredible. Um, he is just a retired guy who goes out with his wife and looks for, looks for bees and takes pictures of them. Uh, he's super duper sweet. So these sweat bees get their name because sometimes they are attracted to people and they will lick up little bits of sweat and that salt there. Uh, they carry their pollen on their hind legs but they're not carrying uh, quite as much of it. They don't have, you know, really brushy hairs there. They nest in the ground and they're one of those where they might share a common entrance to their tunnel with other bees, uh, but they're still taking care of their own nests for the most part. Sometimes they'll aggregate near each other so that their holes are all near each other. And then again, that's another way to just pay attention uh, and try to keep themselves a little bit safer, share some of those guard duties a little bit. But again, even though they might be what we think of as fly colored, there are some very brightly colored wasps. And you're looking for hairs to keep them separate from the wasps. You're looking for those longer eyes in the antennae to keep them separate from flies. And again, looking for what they're doing. Crawling all over a flower is a pretty good sign uh, because wasps and flies are not particularly interested in pollen and nectar. So there are also striped sweat bees. And here you can see those fuzzy leg hairs a little bit better. Um, similarly, I mean, they're very closely related, same family as the green ones. And so they're also nesting in the ground, sometimes rotting wood then carrying their pollen in the same spots. Um, and particularly the females, those stripes um, will be hairy. And so, the hair kind of sticks out, <clears throat> excuse me, over the rest of the cuticle layer. Uh, and sweat bees, I would say, are kind of all season long. They're not particularly early, not particularly late. And there are so many species um, that there's at least one active at probably almost any time. All right, mining bees. The, the bee world's not super creative with their common names. Mining bees nest in the ground, as you might guess from their name. Um, so they are distinguished by, this is something that feels easy to see in pictures, it's sometimes hard to see on the wing, but they have called facial phobia. So they have kind of a channel <clears throat> between their eyes that are filled with hairs. So even this one, you can kind of see that long strip of hairs. I don't know why it's there. I don't know what it does, but I do know that it's indicative of a mining bee in the family Andronidae. A lot of them are very early season bees. And so uh, you'll see them out before it feels like there's even anything for them to forage on. And sometimes they could get confused with bumblebees because they have a similar color. Like they, um, they can have yellow on their thorax, these kind of puffy hairs but their abdomen is smooth. A bumblebee would have hairs everywhere. Uh, and then these mining bees are narrower. Um, they're carrying their pollen on their legs as well. This one up here, you can see a little bit of that yellow. So again, I think they're the earliest probably bees that I see. But the thing with early season bees is that sometimes you have to look in places you don't expect. Uh, a lot of the 
plants that we have in our gardens for spring are uh, our bulbs, our non-native tulips, daffodils, whatever. But a lot of the places where you find early season bees are our native trees. So red maples are an early one. And uh, the flowers aren't particularly showy, right? They're nothing that you would probably cut down and put in a bouquet, but they have great pollen and nectar resources. And so sometimes the place to look for bees is actually up, up high. Um, willows are another great early season plant for bees. So thinking about what's a plant that has the resources, that has the pollen, the nectar. And again, our native bees tend to prefer native plants. And so, so looking for those. Okay, I didn't have, you know, I tried to make this easy, but it can't be too easy for you guys. So there's one group of bees that you should know about that are just going to contradict everything that I have told you about bees so far. I see Becca laughing. Someone has gotten to you already about cuckoo bees. <laughs> All right, so uh, cuckoo bees are like cuckoo birds. Um, they do not take care of their own nests. They look for another bee and then they lay their eggs in that bee's nest uh, so that they can use all the pollen resources that the other bee provided. Uh, for solitary bees, like all the ones on this page, you know, they're just adding their eggs to someone else's nest. And so they might hatch first and eat the other pollen, um, but they're not interfering too much. There are some cuckoo bumblebees that will go into another bumblebee's nest and kill the queen. And for some reason, I don't know if it's pheromones or what, uh, the worker bumblebees are just like, cool, someone else is in charge. Uh, I can take care of those babies. And so yeah, they're missing their queen, but they then continue bringing pollen and nectar. They keep taking care of the eggs from that cuckoo bumblebee. So those cuckoo bumblebees, since they're not doing any pollen collecting, they don't have a place to put pollen, right? They don't have hairs in particular places. They don't have those depressions on their legs to put a ball of pollen because uh, all they're doing is sneaking in and laying eggs. Yes, it's very similar to a cowbird. Um, so uh, like this one on the left, uh, it almost looks more ant-like, right? Without any of those hairs. Uh, and ants are also related to bees and have a lot of similar characteristics, but kind of the coloring, this is a, a nomad bee. Um, something that's gonna take probably a little bit of practice. These two uh, here are nest parasites of different stem nesting bees. And they at least uh, have this kind of, this really tapered pointy abdomen, which is common to several genera. <clears throat> that the pollen collecting bees will be rounded. And then these have the, and I don't know if they are pointier because that's how they get in and how they lay their eggs in someone else's nest. I'm not entirely sure, but it's a good thing to look for. And again, I couldn't let you get out of this thinking that all of this was easy. For anything that I could possibly tell you about bees, there's always gonna be one bee that's totally the opposite. There's always an exception. So I can say they're always solitary. Well, except for this one. They always carry pollen, except for this one. Um, so I apologize. It's just nature, right? Uh, things have all evolved to be very, very different. They have their own approach at dealing with life. Their job is to have more babies and they just have different strategies to do that. Uh, so let's actually go back Let's take if there are questions before we go and practice on some different pictures. Um, so if you have things you're still a little bit unsure about, we can address them and then hopefully we'll do a little better when we look at pictures. But again, there are no consequences. Uh, I know Amy said this is recorded. No one's keeping track of your answers though, right? So if you're wrong, it just means that I get to point out a characteristic you maybe didn't notice and then you learn it and then you'll be better next time you see one outside. All right, so someone is looking at these carefully and thinking these bees kind of look like they have a waspy waist. I'm not sure it's a, well, I would say the one on the left actually probably looks a lot more waspy uh, than it does like a bee. 
And they often tend to, I guess they're not, right? I mean, they're not robust enough to like push into a lobelia or a flower with a key keel because they're not really collecting their bone pollen. You know, they're not, uh, yeah. I haven't thought about that, but I bet that that shape is because they don't need, don't need to be bigger. You know, they're not trying to maximize surface area and collect any more pollen. That's a super interesting observation. It might be a little bit that because they don't have a lot of pollen collecting hairs, uh, we see their outline a little more clearly than we do on some other bees, but probably a little bit of both. Anything else you're wondering about before we go look at some examples, some unlabeled examples? Okay, we'll try it out. Uh, and I hope that this is working okay for you. You have the uh, recording or you will have a recording you can go back to. You have some of those books. Um, there is a Z-Link, sorry, it's our university shorthand. There is a website in there that you can use to find more resources. Um, but I couldn't ship all of you specimens to practice looking at preserved bees. So sorry. All right, so on the left side of all of these slides, I've put your choices. You don't have to remember what all the options are. Uh, so the different bees we talked about, or is this not a bee at all? Go ahead and throw, throw your guesses in the chat. Same. One suggestion for a moth, not a bee, not a bee. Again, we could call this a wannabe. Yep, a moth. Again, we can't see those three body parts. Um, those antenna almost look kind of flat, like little paddles. Um, yeah, a probably clear wing moth. The wings are in motion and it's too hard to see, but I think that's what it is. All right. How about this gal? So things to look at, we're looking for hairs and where are the hairs? Let's see all this bright yellow pollen stuck there under her abdomen. Longer narrower eyes, so we can say it is a bee. Yep, Joyce, a leaf cutter bee. So lots of hairs, um, kind of stripey, not metallic like that mason bee, not narrow like the resin bee. The pollen here shows it's a leaf cutter bee. But, and this bee must have been somewhere else before she was on this butterfly weed because milkweeds have their pollen in little packets. And so uh, it almost looks like the bees have extra feet sometimes but they have these little star-shaped yellow packets stuck to the ends of their feet. It's almost like maybe more extra toes. Um, they have those are called pollinia, the milkweed packets are just stuck to them. Um, and so that's a place where the milk, milkweed has decided a different strategy, not decided. They're not thinking about it, of course, but has a different strategy at getting its pollen around. Well, how about this one? This is another one that bright yellow pollen on the abdomen. And I did not double up on uh, a bee photos. So if it's helping you keep track and you wanna cross leaf cutter bee off the list in your head, go ahead and do that to narrow it down. So a couple different guesses. Um, I think I can guess where some of these are coming from. So it is pretty robust, has some yellow hairs, could look like a bumblebee. Uh, it is not. So there are, uh, the yellow are just hairs that are kind of poofy. And again, the bumblebee would be all covered if it were, if it were a bumblebee. I'm wondering the mining bee, if you're thinking about these hairs in the front, um, they don't come down, you're kind of all the way the length of the eye, the way that they would if they were a facial fove, like a mining bee. But yes, I see mason bee. So that metallic color, kind of stout 
almost a flyer shape, and then the pollen on the underside of the abdomen. All right, next up. Couple things coming in. Yeah, you guys are cued in on things. It is not a bee, uh, it is a solitary wasp. So this smooth, smooth body, you know, elongated. I can see where it headed with that cuckoo bee and I know they can be confusing. Um, sometimes it might just be a thing you get used to seeing, seeing wasps, but this kind of color pattern is way, way more common in wasps than in bees. The yellow and black stripes that we draw cartoon bees to have or almost never on bees. All right, I'm down to one of these bee types. Look at all of that pollen. Holy cow, that skinny leg right now is just beefed up with pollen. All right, so yeah, a lot of you are cluing in to those facial fovea, to the rows of hairs. Uh, the one comment, it could be a honeybee. So I, I see where that's tricky, right? So these, the hairs are next to the eyes. And if it's a honeybee, the hairs are on the eyeball themselves, which seems totally wild and hard to imagine and super duper weird. But again, that, that's how nature does things. Uh, honeybees would also have their pollen in a ball, right? This is getting to be a pretty big pile there, um, but it'll be smoother, rounder. They've made that into a little patty versus just, you know, walked past enough pollen to keep getting it stuck. All right, you guys are doing pretty well. How about this one? Pay attention to again, the hairs on the underside here. It's hard to get an idea for scale, um, right? We can just tell it's a mint, maybe not sure. But yep, a resin bee. Again, that pollen carrying hairs on the underside of the abdomen, that dark color. And again, please don't feel bad if you're guessing and you're not right. Again, chance to learn together. And there are over 400 kinds of bees in Minnesota. There's no way in an hour that I would teach you all of them. I mean, I'm, I'm just not that good. All right, how about this gal? We know Rachel is not colorblind. She's commented very clearly that it's green. Yep, you guys are all noticing the same things, a green sweat bee. Not a fly, it has all of that pollen here, um, but it is that really bright green metallic color. You get different from a fly to the pollen, the eyes we see there on the side, they're not meeting on the top of the head, um, those longer antennae. I just have high fives all the way around. Okay, how about this one? While you're thinking, you can just notice how amazing these eyes are to have that kind of pattern. And yep, Stuart's got it. This is a cuckoo bee. Um, so that really pointed abdomen. It's got some hairs, but it's not using them to collect pollen. They're really nowhere that's terribly helpful. I think that, okay, one more. So one comment that it is not a bee. Someone who's a little unsure of the question mark. All right, so this one, uh, and it is next to, it looks like a bumblebee here. Uh, I put in, cause I put it on naturalist and I was very proud of myself that I had identified this wasp. It's not even a wasp. 
Uh, it is a fly. So it looks so much like that wasp that we saw earlier, that smooth abdomen, mostly black with these yellow stripes. But you have to look carefully at the face, those big round eyes, those stubby little antennae. Um, I sometimes feel very embarrassed when I put things up on iNaturalist with identifications that are wildly inaccurate. Uh, but iNaturalist is a nice, friendly place. Everyone leaves you kind comments and helps you get better. Oh, I am so sorry. I miscounted my slides. So we have a bumblebee here. Nice, big, round, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy and all over. Those antennae are bent down there, longer eyes. And then uh, we will, I will maybe save questions because I know that Amy has some things that she has to get to, but you're also welcome to, I can put my, um, my email address in the chat after this, and then you can send anything my way. Great. Thank you so much, Britt. I know I learned a ton and I hope you all did too. Um, I just also wanted to put in a quick pitch here that if you're interested in learning more um, about pollinators and monitoring, we're going to be doing a hands-on training live in person out at Thunder Bay Park in Little Canada with one of Britt's colleagues, Aileen, uh, next Saturday. So Saturday, August 21st. I think we still have a handful of spots open. Um, with that one, we have a very limited capacity. So if you are interested in learning more, please visit the website below, shoot me an email. I'll also send a link to all of this um, to everyone following the presentation. Um, we're also doing some other activities, kind of four pollinators coming up this fall. So we're doing a milkweed seed collection, kind of a seed drive. So if you've got milkweed growing in your garden or have access to it, um, we would love to collect it to distribute it for our other pollinator friends. And of course, join one of our habitat restoration volunteer events coming up this fall, spring as well. Um, we're doing some plantings and some other work to help uh, make those pollinators happy and create more habitat. Um, I can be reached at volunteer at greatrivergreening.org or you all have my email as well. Um, so just, yeah, thanks again to everybody. And if you have some more questions for Britt, she will stick around for a few more minutes. Um, I just wanted to jump in and say at the end, um, we appreciate all the help we're getting from the University of Minnesota. Um, all of your staff and uh, resources are fantastic. And we couldn't be doing what we're doing without the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation funds that we've received uh, for this training, for the uh, monitoring training next Saturday. And then also uh, put a plug in for iNaturalist and just going outside, looking at bees, um, looking at flowers, just experiencing kind of what's out. There's still a ton of life um, still left in the, the fall that we have right now. Um, we've got a couple projects up on iNaturalist. Uh, if you basically go to that same website, put in Great River Greening in the search bar uh, and you'll get a couple of collections of um, parks that we're interested in, in monitoring or just go outside, take some pictures in your backyard. Um, you can post iNaturalist and even just, it will automatically attempt to ID it for you. So can I even just kind of help you with that um, kind of upfront learning? And if you keep wanting to go and post and join the community, it's a, I found a really great resource and a really good um, group of people that are again, just here to, to help uh, everybody learn. So I'll pass it back over to Britt. I'll see what, uh, I think we're getting some questions, which is fantastic. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, and I can just add really quick that uh, Britt did help us with the presentation uh, about a month ago, uh, featuring iNaturalist and pollinator photography tips. And we have a recording of that presentation as well as this presentation is being recorded and I will get both of those links sent out to everybody as well. So if you are new to iNaturalist or would like a refresher on kind of how to use that, we can share those resources as well. Cool, well, I'll just answer a couple of things I saw come through chat. But again, I did put my email address in there if you have bigger, bigger things come up. Uh, so we are at the end of most bumblebee colonies life cycles. And so if you're seeing big, big bumblebees out there, it is entirely possible they're queens. 
there's a wide range of sizes of bumblebees. So there are some species where uh, they just don't get that big. And so the queens aren't enormous. And there's some where like Bombus or Acomus, even the workers tend to be pretty huge. Um, queens are larger than workers, but again, it depends on the species, but it is the end of the season where new queens are being created or it's the end of season as far as, as we can tell. <clears throat> it was a bit of a weird year where I heard a lot of um, bumblebee ecologists were seeing males really early in the season at a strange time. Uh, we'll have to wait until all the data comes in to see exactly what's going on with that. I think the other question that I saw was about best ways to, to work on identifying. And yeah, I would say taking, taking your pictures and then going back um, to look at them you'd be a little more systematic. Um, sorry, <laughs> glad that my cat's tail could now make it in this recording. Uh, but just sitting and watching them, sometimes taking pictures is distracting. Like sometimes it's nice for to just take the time and figure out what you're looking at. And again, you can look for those behaviors a little bit more. Sometimes that's particular flowers like bee balm, they'll tend to go, in and out of individual florets really quickly, but they go in this horizontal circle. And so you can kind of then get to think about, well, where are they gonna be next, right? Where do I have the opportunity to take a good picture or where do I have to be to see the things that I really wanna see about them? Now there's a question about a young queen bumblebee and staying near her nest. She may or may not, uh, they disperse pretty well, right? So, they don't want all of your new queens to try to stay in the same place because that means that next year you're all competing for the same resources. So they'll typically fly. I don't, I couldn't give you a number, like a number of miles away, um, but far enough that next year uh, they won't be competing with each other. Uh, there's a question about landscaping. Um, there are holes that are suspected to be bee nests now and thinking about how to, how to be careful with them as you change landscaping. Uh, I mean, I, I have bees that nest in my vegetable garden and I dig that up every year to plant more vegetables. Uh, so it depends what kind of landscaping, like you're bringing in a bobcat landscaping. Okay, well, you're, you're probably gonna disturb their nests, right? But if you are changing over the perennials that you have there, I wouldn't worry about it too much. For the bee atlas, when we put out wooden nesting blocks and uh, then reared those later on to see what came out of them, we had one block that got thrown in a pond at Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary. And so I don't know how long the block floated there in the pond, but we reared bees out of it. Um, and so they must have some kind of waterproof type lining. Um, and so they can stand up to some, some level of disturbance. I know that's a very extension, it depends, non-answer answer, but I can't tell you exactly. I see, thank you for your clarification, Rachel, um, that you would prefer the bees not go back there. So uh, bees that nest in the ground need a way to get to the ground. So if there's heavy mulch or heavy grass that they can't get through very well, then they won't nest there. Um, so, and if you're, you know, not wanting to harm them. If you pay attention, if you can time your, your work to be after um, they've, after you see the adults around, then you can kind of interrupt so that they find another place to lay their eggs. They're not looking to put them back near where they emerge themselves. <laughs> so it's very drastic. If I cover them now, I'm dooming them. <laughs> uh, it, I suppose it depends on how deep they are. I mean, they could dig themselves out a little distance. I don't know exactly how far is too far for a bee to dig out, you know, as a freshly emerged adult. But uh, for, for landscape management, things like burning prairies, you know, it's better to do it in stages where you wouldn't burn the entire thing, you burn some of it. And so, the bees are nesting in those stems don't turn out so well, but the plants that come up are really great for bees. Uh, it's hard to do a retaining wall in stages like that. I mean, I understand that on your scale of your yard, it's not quite the same as if you're doing landscape level management. Um, but again, if you could try to time it, maybe. 
best. Or uh, if you're going to dig up a bunch of soil, maybe you just move the soil somewhere else, right? And then if those little cocoons are in the soil, they can emerge. Same thing as if you have to cut down a bunch of stems that might have bee nests in them. You know, don't put them in your compost. Don't burn them. Don't take them to the, um, you know, county compost site. If you kind of move them to the edge of your yard under a tree or something, I had a lot of my stuff under a lilac bush. You know, then the bees that are in there can get out next season, but it's not very tempting for new bees to come and live there. Like no one says, look at that big, dark, scary place. I bet that's a cool place to live. So again, you can kind of move them elsewhere and then that. Right, they might, they might climb out of that soil pile where you've moved it next year. I think the only other question I saw is about bird baths. Um, that advice about putting water out for bees is typically for honeybees. Um, they need water for cooling because they have so many bees in the little space. Um, but native bees aren't really picking up water and carrying it anywhere, the solitary ones. All right, I haven't seen new questions in, but again, my, my email is there. Uh, and I definitely recommend checking out the U of M Bee Lab as well for resources there. All right, great. Thanks again, Britt, and thanks everybody for joining us this evening. Like I said, we'll send out some additional resources and links to the recording, and we hope to see you all again soon.